of your gifts and everything. This is, as you know, this, this is a very ambitious uh, undertaking that we're doing at this moment. Um, this, this is ambitious. We are going to really, in a certain respect, stay with one story. That's going to be my story. But I want you to know that in your mind, please play your story. And we had a set of agreements. We'll probably give them out. But the only story that you really know is your own story. The only story. It should. It's, it's intended to. The only story that you really know is your own story. Because a person who has been traumatized, they seek to tell their story. But each time they tell it, there's something that they leave out. And part of it is because of the fact that they really don't know exactly yet how they got over, how they came through. Trauma is a death experience. My definition of trauma is that, and, and you can look inside the book, if you look at page 27, I believe it is, at the first paragraph that begins inside of the book, it says, trauma is distinguished from more ordinary experiences of suffering in two ways. The first is in the character of the initial event. In trauma, there's a threat to a person's life or body that is so overwhelming as to destroy all normal systems of trust and safety, a safety and trust. That's, no matter how you have prepared for it, no matter how the levees in New Orleans were built, when Katrina comes through, it's trauma. No matter what they have done in, or in Japan to prepare for whatever they thought was coming, whether it was an earthquake or the sea or the ocean rising, when the tsunami came, they were not prepared for that. Trauma is like that. Remember, it's all taking place in the mind. The outside is only to inform you of what's in your mind and you perhaps have not paid attention to. So trauma, first of all, has to be trauma. Has to be trauma. The next item says, a second characteristic of trauma is its continued insinuation into the victim's life. Insinuation, when I look that word up, it is a suggestion or a hint. And so trauma, when it occurs to you, really in a certain respect has no real meaning whatsoever. It's an event. But when you give it meaning, when that item is excited or the same kind of items are brought before you again, you add the meaning that you gave to the trauma and it hints and you accept that hint and it comes back and replays in your mind again. Most of it, most times it's done unconsciously. Hallucinations, flashbacks, all of these things happen. Anybody who has been traumatized, whatever the trauma has been, whatever it has been, it hints that it's still going on. And the only thing that stands between you and your new life is the story that you keep telling to yourself. It keeps hinting that it is your only story. It keeps hinting that it is your real story. So trauma does not have to be just simply physical or sexual abuse. Trauma is any story that you keep repeating to yourself and saying this is the truth. And there's no outside event that can ever happen in your life that is the truth. Because they just sung. We are spiritual. Right? We are spiritual. Having an earthly experience. So we are not defined from the outside. I'm not what happened to me. As a matter of fact, I'm not simply this body. 
Does that make sense to you? Ego will tell us that we must protect this body and then it comes forth with self-preservation is the first law of nature. But it's telling you about the small self. Small S, small E, small L, small F. Protect that. Because with the death of ego, you're stepping into the large S, the large E, the large L, the large F. Dr. Beckwith has an item, something about a bad day for the ego. The ego is a good day for the spirit or something to that effect. And that's a true statement. So how is it possible that trauma can be a good day? Let me premise to you the idea that you've been here before and that you agreed to come here this time. Before the foundation of the world, you made an agreement that you would come. And you would come by virtue, and this, I'm, I'm just presenting this. Let it marinate through you a bit. You agreed to come. And you want it to unfold. And you wanted to do it as quickly as possible. And you covenanted with somebody or something that you would have a traumatic event. I like that. I'm glad you did that. I want you to actually feel that. In order to move into your new life, you must release blame. And I'm just presenting you with one idea of how you might do that. And I know that what I'm saying is a challenge. I already know that. Remember, I said that by myself I fought it for nearly 30 years. There are some things that are about trauma, and they are inside of the book. One of them is the aspect of blame. A victim always has a blame story. Always. Somebody else did it. Somebody else was responsible. And how can you be God? Who could you blame? Who can you blame being God? There is no other. God is all there is. All there is is God. How's this feel? You just got like totally silent. Turn to your neighbor and say, this doesn't feel quite the way I want it to feel at this moment. Just tell you, this don't feel quite the way I want it to feel at this moment. Oh, just be real. You might want to curse a little bit, but... <laughs> They say, hell no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Blame. Blame I call other directed anger. Utter, other. Somebody else is responsible. This is on page 26, I believe it is. And the other aspect is shame. And shame is self-directed anger. Shame, blame says it's somebody else's fault. Shame says I'm inadequate. I was sent here Lacking something. And as a result of that, that's why this happened. Something is missing. But again, you've never left the Father's house. Never left the Father's house. You're having an experience. You're in a dimension. You're in 
one of the mansions. You are spirit. And so the aspect is, before the foundation of the earth, before I agreed to incarnate here, in some way, I picked out my mother and my sisters. And this may seem very new to some, but there are tribes, if you will, or nations in Africa that teach this. And one of the things that has happened to individuals is that we've been disconnected from our homelands, whether it's Africa or Europe or all of that, that we are all, how did Shakespeare put it? It says, you know, the whole world is a stage and we are but actors. We are playing a play. I love it. How many of you saw the, uh, what do they call them, the Oscars? How many of you saw the Oscars? Did you see the Oscars? I was watching Oprah do um, Sally Fields. And Sally Fields talked about how uh, Spielberg, uh, who did Lincoln, um, how he made it possible for her to stay in character all day long. And that's amazing. The makeup goes on, the mask, the persona. And then she stays in character all day long. And the whole environment is set up just like that. I would present to you that we all have a persona, a mask that we have put on to play this game that we call life. And in this particular play, some of us agree that we would be hurt in particular ways. Now, this became an option for me because of the fact that between my sisters and my mother, I was hating. How does a baby hate, or how does a boy hate his own mother? But I was hating. It's mama's fault. And then I did daddy's fault and all of this other stuff. Blame. And I was hurt and very wounded. Can you identify? Can you understand? But if you're working with somebody who's been traumatized, it's painful. And I stayed there a long, long time. Let me tell you some other things that go along with trauma. There are three losses that I talk about. I call it VIT. The first one is that you lose your voice. A person who's been traumatized finds it difficult, finds it challenging to tell anybody what has happened to him or her. As a matter of fact, in so many places, we shut down people who try to share their story. We shut them down. We refuse to listen anymore to what they said. And the reason why the individual is trying is because they really don't know exactly how they got through. I, th I think of trauma. They used to make golf balls that had rubber bands and you just, you, if you got inside of it, you tried to pull one piece of that rubber across uh, out of the ball and unwind the whole thing. You just couldn't do it. It would, had been hit and traumatized so much and when you started pulling it, it just would tear apart. And trauma is like that. Trauma is like that. And so you try to tell, and people won't allow you to tell it. And you find it difficult to tell yourself. And you do try by the flashbacks or whatever it may be to unravel it. But sometimes it just becomes so horrific that you never get to the hero part. And you shut it down. You shut it down. You lose your voice. The next one is that you lose your identity. In my day, if something happened to you traumatic, they would say things like, you don't tell family business. It doesn't matter what Uncle Joe or Aunt Sue or whoever it was was doing. You don't hang dirty laundry on the line. You can hide cancer all you want. 
if you're receiving it, it's going to grow, even if it's hidden. Your best option is have it diagnosed, looked at it, go through a process, and I am one of those individuals that believes that whatever your process may be, it can include. I, do, I personally do not believe that theology or new thought is just anti-modern medicine. I, I don't believe that personally, you know. So, you know, I'm not going to keep my child home and whatever the process may be until they die. That's not me. But I am going to treat them in regard to what I know, but I'm also going to consult medical authorities. Does that make sense to you? So that's just, that's just me in regard to that. And I'll tell you a little bit about how I even get here that comes along with part of that. But you become known as a person that the trauma has happened to. You become known. It becomes your identity. That's the girl who, is this making sense to you? Can you identify? Yeah. And even inside of spiritual communities, people end up telling the stories that they have heard. And they don't always tell them to benefit the person that they heard them from. And they don't get the story right. The last one is time. Trauma inserts itself back into your life. And when it does, it seems like it is again happening now. Right now. Is going on now. And you're living it. And if it's a dream, it's a nightmare. You're feeling it. And sometimes for years, I say for decades, it could be for lifetimes that this is happening. And the person isn't looked at it. And remember, you know the statistics. I've mentioned them before. One out of four females, one out of six males, it is a pandemic and it's worldwide that is happening. It's worldwide. It is part of what the individual calls, uh, Dr. Ernest Holmes calls, it's part of the race consciousness. It's part of the race consciousness. And if you bury trauma, I, 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 again, I love these individuals. Dr. Holmes says you bury things and you bury them alive. They're not dead. You suppress it, is still alive. When I first got into this, I read a book called um, Healing the Child Within. Healing the Child. And I began to understand that there were moments when that child was controlling me. And I was acting like that child. Some people say, well, I'm going to put my religion on the shelf and just give you a piece of my... Yeah. Trauma. Voice, identity, time, blame, shame. I want to ask you, do you have a blame story? Whose fault is it? If you are assigning blame, every victim has a blame story. Every victim has a blame story. And so I want to ask you to contemplate. Let me see if I've got something. Again, you know that Dr. Dr. Beckwith is both a friend. He is someone that I, I dearly love and appreciate. And some of you, I noticed that you do sell here um, his, um, his life visioning kit. Now, it's possible to buy a book, buy a kit, and never do the work. But we don't do that, right? We do the work. Some people, you know, they get a book and they read the uh, first, like, three or four pages and they put the book down and they say, well, I bought your book. No, you didn't. You paid for it. But you have not yet bought the book because then we can have a real discussion about the book. It's different. So what I'm asking you, if you got the life visioning kit, I want you just for a moment as you sit there and I want you to listen to Dr. Beckwith as he talks about having a blame story. Is this up as far as it can go? Yeah. 
Amen. And this is really, what, what happened with me is that when I went to Agape, there are some things I had not really been exposed to in regard to Dr. Beckwith. And I went there and I had a moment, I had a moment where they asked me, they asked Vielke and I, if we would stand up and talk about why we're there and what we're doing there. And I had my book, my book is written in 2005. And I had my book there. And I begin to go through this process that we're going to talk about where it says, no blame, blame no one. And I'm into the next area now. The next one is feel no shame. Blame no one, feel no shame. And the following step was forgive everybody. Dr. Beckwith did what I did with when I came here on February the 10th. Dr. Beckwith stood up out of his seat. And he said, you know these people are loving you right now. Just stood right up because he could see that there is one God, one thought, there's one mind. And what spirit had given him, spirit does buckshot. It had gone out and I had caught just a little. And I was so glad to be in a flock that flew the way I flew. I was overjoyed. But then he took me deeper. He said, you've got to actually own this, that there is no blame story that you hold on to. And I'm still working on this. As a matter of fact, as I prepared to come here, I had to get rid of a level of blame. My son, I didn't know he was going to come. He was invited, but I wasn't sure he was coming. He was thinking that I was saying to him that being a trauma specialist, and he is, that what he offered was not good enough. And I was seeking to grow him in new thought instantaneously. I had somebody that I wanted him to listen to and all of this other kind of stuff. and I just arrived at the point where I just needed to say to him, do your journey. I trust spirit. Do your journey. And I had to make sure that he understood that I am so thankful to be his dad. I'm overjoyed. And I'm thankful that he's on a journey. I know just by being here that his journey continues. I am so glad and so thankful. And I had to work with all kinds of things. So as you listen, I want you to just go inside and see. Maybe you're blaming this spiritual community. Pastor, Reverend Jones, other individuals here. Maybe you're blaming your race or your ethnic group or whatever it may be. You're blaming whoever abused you, whoever hurt you. You've got a blame story. And it is just another story. Work with that. We've got some other things that we can do to move you through, but for this particular time and moment, just work with that. And maybe you want to write out how you feel about that. Do not say the 
just notice that you're participating in that point of view and the subsequent thoughts that would emerge from that point of view. Again, do not tear yourself down. Were you able to do that? Without judgment. Without judgment. I'm going to go. We there there is so much that I want to pull into this and it's challenging to do so. And I understand that. But what we're inviting you really to do is to go through the trauma so that we can get to the triumph. And after a while, the trauma, you just know that you're not your body. I'm not what happened to me. I'm not my old 